ahead and pull Chris up and he can introduce himself. Hello, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing this morning? Pretty good. I was saying that I'm going to let you introduce yourself because last time I'm like, I just went on chatting like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to do our thing. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? <laughs> sure. Well, hello, everybody. I am Chris Marchini with Rose City Originals. So I'm a quilt pattern designer and I have a lot of uh, social media posts where you can go and learn tips and tricks about improving your quilting skills. Uh, my pages are definitely a safe place, especially for new quilters. We don't judge, we just help. Love it. That's a perfect explanation. Today, Chris is going to show a little bit about his TL 2010Q and some accessories that he uses with that machine. So without further ado, Chris, I will let you take it away. Sounds good. All right, so I've already got my machine all set up here. There are four feet that I'm going to be talking about today that go with uh, specifically the TL2010Q that I use. Uh, but most of these feeds, some version of it is available for pretty much any sewing machine out on the market. So the few feet that we're going to talk about first, we have our stitch in the ditch foot. So you can see it has a little guide there that is directly in the center. And that's going to help you follow your seams if you just want to do some simple stitch in the ditch quilting. We're also going to talk about our walking foot and why this is important, especially if you have a bulky quilt. Then we're going to get a little more complicated, talk about our ruler foot. We're going to use some westerly guides and do some ruler work. And after that, we're going to go crazy with our free motion foot. And this is where you can just doodle away all day on your quilt and get a really cool quilting design. So let's uh, get me moved over. I'm going to change my camera. Whoops, wrong button. There we go. All right. So before we start quilting, a few tips. First is your needle size. So when you're piecing your quilt, you're probably using a 10 or a 12, depending on your fabric. When you're doing your top stitch quilting, you want to up that needle size. Remember, you're going through not only your quilt, you're going through your batting, you're going through your backing. And if you've pressed your seams to the side, you're going to have a lot of bulk in spots. So you want a needle that's not going to flex when you hit that. So right now I have a number 16 in here. If you have a quilting needle or a top stitch needle, those work very well for this as well. Um, I always recommend doing a test first. With straight line quilting, it's not so bad, but with your free motion, you want to make sure that your tension is set right. And we just had that lovely segment on tension. So you know if you need to up it or down it, um, depending on where your knot is ending up. Another tip for both straight line and free motion is to lower your speed. If your machine can actually lower its speed, uh, mine has a little oops, dial right here. So I have it at about 50%. That keeps me from running away with my foot control. If not, just uh, if you don't have a speed control built into your machine, just try to remember not to, you know, go pedal to the metal and floor it every time. You want to go nice and slow when you're doing your quilting. And lastly, when you're doing straight line quilting, I always like to increase my stitch length. I normally piece at about a two and I'll increase my stitch length to a three when I'm doing my top stitch quilting. All right, so let's get our foot changed here. I still have my quarter inch piecing foot in. So changing feet on your machine is super easy. There's a thumb screw on the side here. For this foot, it has a notch in it, so it just slides right out. We'll start with our uh, stitch in the ditch foot, which just has a notch. So we'll just slip that on and tighten this down nice and tight. If you have trouble tightening it with your fingers, most machines come with the screwdriver. If not, you can just grab any flathead screwdriver and make sure that's on there real good. All right, let's lay this out. For our straight line quilting, so the stitch in the ditch foot and the walking foot, my feed dogs are still up because I need my machine to help me push that fabric through. I've already got my quilt top all basted. I've got my pins in here. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you remove your pins as you sew. If they're gonna be in your path, you don't wanna sew over 
your safety pins because you won't be able to get them out without breaking your stitching. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> We're just gonna start. This foot is really handy if you're wanting just simple, simple straight line quilting right in your seams so that you don't really see it, but it gives you that, um, the benefit of having it quilted, it keeps all your layers together, but it doesn't distract from your beautiful fabric. We're just gonna go nice and slow and you just keep that guide right on the seam. When you're quilting um, or sewing in general, really, it's best not to watch your needle. That will get you all kinds of messed up and off track. You wanna watch the front of your foot and so with this foot having that little guide, it makes it really handy. I've got a little bump there. Just gonna ease that in. Chris, do you prefer to use your speed control or do you like to just kind of manually control it with your foot? Um, so I am doing some manual control with my foot, but lowering the speed control, I will tell you, has helped me immensely because I'm, I'm a fast sewer. Like when I'm piecing, I am just ripping through it like crazy. And I'll forget, <laughs> yes, I'll forget that I need to slow down when I'm quilting. So adjusting the speed control is a good reminder for that. And, you know, sometimes your foot just slips and you go all the way, you know, all the way to the floor. And this way, if that happens, it's not that big a deal. I understand that. That goes with the ask me how I know. When you get tired and your foot just falls. <laughs> yes. All right. We just got that done. I do have a little bit of a bump there. I did something I shouldn't have done on this particular sample and actually stitched all the way around the edges first. And I should have left them loose because then you get, when you get to the end, it just pushes it out where it wants to go. Um, just in case anyone is wondering, for this quilt in particular, I'm actually using Inselbright as my batting because eventually these will end up as some oven mitts. So you might hear a little crinkle. I don't know if that actually picks up on the microphone or not. I'm not so hearing the go. crinkle, but those are going to be super cute oven mitts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the same fabric I used at our last So Creative Live for that, my first quilt. I noticed that. <laughs> Very cute. Thank you. So there I just stitched that and you can't see it. I'm using some variegated uh, Aurifil thread. It's like a, a gray to white. So it matches this gray here, but this foot really helps you keep right in that seam. So your stitches basically disappear. So if you're not super confident in your top stitching, this is a great option when you're first learning. We'll do one more line here. Definitely chime in if there's any questions in the chat. I'm sure there are lots. We do have one from Polly. She says, does this Juki have more speed than the average machine? I would say yes. I don't know what its exact stitches per minute is, but I know it goes super fast when I have the speed turned all the way up and I just floor it when I'm piecing. It just zooms straight through it. <laughs> I believe it's 1200. Brian, can you confirm that for me? 1500. 1500. So. It's very speedy. Uh, I also have the same machine and I utilize the speed control because I'm not up to that 1500 <laughs> stitches per minute yet. <laughs> One thing that I do want to interject with the stitch in a ditch foot, um, if we all notice like the needles directly behind his guide, uh, there are stitch and ditch feet for your other type of machine as well, where you can move the needle and use it more like an edge stitch foot. But you do have to make sure that there's a wider opening where the needle goes into the fabric. But it's really cool to know that a straight stitch machine has different feet, you know, so you can do different applications. I love that. Yeah, very similar to this foot. I also just got, no, I don't know where I put it, um, another quarter inch foot. That is the same thing. It has a guide, but it's off to the side. So it's mm -hmm. a quarter inch from the needle. So this is really handy because it doesn't let your fabric pass underneath when you're doing your piecing. 
versus this quarter inch foot where you're just lining it up here and visually keeping it on track. There are lots and lots of different feet available for pretty much any machine, even like I used to sew exclusively on vintage machines. And just if you know if your machine is high shank or low shank, you can get a lot of these aftermarket feet um, for your machine, which come in really handy. Okay, so there's a couple lines of our stitch in the ditch. So now we're going to switch over to our walking foot. Now, a walking foot might look like a strange contraption if you've never used one, and it, it kind of is. There's a couple different moving pieces on here. So here's the screw hole where we're going to mount it to our sewing machine shaft. And this part right here that moves up and down, it looks like a little claw, is actually going to go... Let's see if I can move my camera just a little. But it's going to go over this needle bar right here. And as your needle goes up and down, it's going to move this up and down. And when this moves up and down, it moves these little feet right here up and down, which are spring loaded. They move front and back. And this basically gives you your feed dogs on the bottom moving your machine and then feed dogs on the top moving the top layer at the same rate. This is especially important if you're working with a bulky quilt or bulky material in general, like if you're sewing with minky definitely want to use a walking foot. If you've got a high loft batting, a walking foot is going to be your best friend. Um, uh, like silky fabric, stuff that's really slick and doesn't want to stay together with friction. This is going to help you move both layers through evenly. Chris, can you clarify what high loft batting is? Sure. So like I said, I'm using uh, Insole Bright here, which is pretty thin. It's... Um, it's just like the insulating layer and then some fuzz on it. A high loft batting, and I don't think I have any examples, but it would be like a, a polyester batting, you know, that's super fluffy. Sometimes it's, you know, a quarter inch up to a half inch thick. It's, it's super soft and easy to squish, but it's got a high loft to it. It's very puffy. That's a good word for it. So if it's puffy and you've got all these layers, you know, it's going to sit up really high until your uh, foot hits it. And that's where it's going to squish it down. And if you're using just your regular foot, your top layer and your bottom layer are going to end up moving around. So when you're all done, it's going to look kind of twisted. All right. So this particular foot only has a hole and not a notch like our other foot. So we have to take the thumb screw all the way out. Of course, I used a screwdriver, so I tightened it beyond what I could do with my finger. So you got to take that thumb screw all the way out. Make sure you don't lose that. Those are very important. Take off our old foot. And now this foot can be a little tricky to get on when you're first starting out because you need to get this little claw over the needle bar, which I tend to do first, and then swing in the other side to go over the shaft. We'll line up the holes and then screw it in. This particular walking foot actually came with the TL2010Q. So it's obviously compatible and works perfectly for it. Um, if you are needing to get an aftermarket walking foot, I know that the website for sewing parts online has a bunch of compatibility charts when you're looking at them to make sure that it works for your particular machine. Now, first I'm just going to do a quick straight line. Well. I say quick. We, again, need to go slow. I hear it said a lot, this is a walking foot, not a running foot. You don't want to go too fast with this foot on. Um, I have broken walking feet in the past by going too fast. So just take your time. This isn't a race. And I just try to keep the seam halfway between in this little gap right here. You know, unfortunately, this doesn't have the benefit of that guide to go straight down the seam. So this one takes a little more care and effort if you're wanting to get directly in that seam for a stitch in the ditch. But you can see every time I stitch and this comes down, these little feet come up. That's allowing um, the machine to move them forward so that when it goes down, just do this in slow-mo so it goes down and right now my 
underside feed dogs are about to pull the fabric back. And you can see that those are moving back as well. Well, you can kind of see it's a little far away. So they move back along with the underside feed dogs so that you have a nice even feed. And it doesn't matter what stitch length you're on, it's going to do the same thing. They're spring loaded. Um, so they just go along with whatever the underside feed dogs are gonna pull the fabric through whatever length. Almost to the end. And while Chris is doing that, I just want to let everybody know, he's joined us in the past and he did a full quilt tutorial, like a beginner's quilt and had a great PDF and everything available. It was wonderful. So if you are new to quilting and you're looking for a great tutorial, I would highly recommend checking out his previous um, segment. So uh, it was, it's totally worth watching. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. There, so now we've got another one. I did pretty good keeping on target in that seam. Um, with a walking foot, it's a little more, I think, versatile than a lot of people think. They think all you can do is straight line quilting with it. But you can actually do some really cool designs um, with just some slight movement. So I'll show you here. We'll go down the center of this row. And I'm going to do just kind of a wavy line. And wavy lines can be really cool. Um, they're a little more freeing. You don't have to be quite so precise. And you just kind of gently rock back and forth. And if you do your whole quilt full of wavy lines that don't really echo each other, they're, you know, each line is unique and kind of goes along its own path. Uh, it gives a really cool all over effect to your quilt. Just lots of movement. Sometimes they might you know, cross over depending on how close you do them to each other. But it just gives kind of that, you know, artistic free form look to your overall quilt. When doing the wavy lines too, it'd probably look really cool with that high loft batting to give that puff and texture also. Yes, absolutely. We also have a Facebook user asking, what stitch length are you using right now? Currently my machine is set at a three. I like to do a little bit bigger stitch when I'm doing my top stitching, um, especially if you're using like a decorative thread where you can like see your individual stitches. I just think it looks really nice and polished that way. Three is my go-to too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think most machines like for piecing, you're at like a 2.5. I have found that to be a little big for my piecing. So I go down to a two for my piecing and then up to a three for my quilting. And that's kind of where my machine lives in its little happy zone. So there you can see I've got just a gentle wave there. I can do another one. You can even go over your seam and just kind of, you know, veer off every now and then. The more you do it, the less it looks like an accident and the more it looks intentional. So a fun tip there, if you're having trouble staying on your seam, just try to, or you could, I mean, really just give up on staying on your seam and just kind of rock back and forth to go over it. Um, another thing you can do with your walking foot, let's see if I can get this set up here. You can even do like concentric circles if they're large enough. So if I had some curved piecing here, I don't think I have anything with curves. You can follow along. Let's we'll pretend there's a curve here. And you can even get in some curves, so long as you're not trying to do like tiny little pebble circles. Let me go for one. You can, there we go. You can get curves and then you can echo that. This particular foot is about a quarter inch from the needle to the edge. So you can just follow along.
Talking about doing curves, um, on the social circle that, uh, an episode we did a couple of weeks ago, we actually did oven mitts and you do go around curves and I use this very walking foot and oh my goodness, it was a lifesaver. So when you make your, your oven mitts, that'll definitely come in handy. <laughs> that is good to know. Yeah. Especially cause I mean, these are going to become oven mitts. Yep. Um, you'll have two layers of your top quilting. You'll have two layers of batting, two layers of backing. So you're going to be dealing with quite a thick thick bit there so that's a really good tip so there you go i just followed a quarter inch and you can just keep going um if you i don't think this one has it some walking feet have a little gap where you could put a bar in that has a guide on it so you can adjust that guide so it follows your previous stitching so you can get like an inch apart or however wide it goes that's another option you can do with your walking foot. Uh, when I did my first quilt tutorial walkthrough on the previous Sell Creative Live, we also used some painter's tape, which I don't know where I put it, but here's some masking tape. And you can use this to mark out where you want your lines. This is especially helpful if you're wanting to do like a diagonal quilting and your squares are rather large and you want to keep on a straight line. Flip it over and we'll work on this other side. So let's say I wanted to sew diagonally here, but this was a solid piece, it not um, patchwork, because this is fairly short distance. You can follow that. But you can take your masking tape and place it down about a quarter inch away from the corners, because this is a quarter inch from the needle to the edge of the foot. So you can just lay that down. There we go. And then follow that with your foot. Chris, have... NC Brooks is asking, uh, when using the walking foot, do you recommend that the lower, oh, excuse me, let me read that again. Do you recommend lowering the feed dogs halfway up or all the way up? They should be all the way up, just like you're sewing normally. My machine here only has the option for up and down. There's no like in between. I do know that some machines though, you can have a couple different settings. So it's just barely grabbing the fabric versus you know having them fully engaged. But definitely keep your feed dogs fully engaged for this. That's what makes these work. These aren't, um, they're not mechanical. There's nothing actually pushing and pulling the little feed dogs on the foot. They're just spring loaded. And what it does is when they're down, you'll see that, well, maybe you won't see too much, but these feet, it actually lifts up. So these are not pressing on the fabric right now, just these ones. And because they're spring loaded, it'll move them back and forth with whatever force is being placed by the machine itself. So if your feet dogs were down, your fabric's gonna stay in place these aren't gonna actually move it. So you need your feed dogs to remain engaged for your walking foot. Thank you. You're welcome. I have seen some folks use the masking tape trick and actually placing the edge of the tape right on the corner where you want to sew and then sewing so that your needle is right on the edge of the tape. And I don't like doing that because then if you hit the tape, like you're sewing the tape to your piece, and then you got to pull out the tweezers and pick out tiny little pieces of tape, which is not fun. <laughs> so I like to do it a quarter inch away from where I want it to be sewn and then just follow that. I believe you touched on this before, but Karen is asking, do you sew your outer edge of the quilt before quilting? So I did on this one and I regret it because as I get to the edge, it's making a little bump. Let's see if it does it on this side. Um, I recommend not doing that. I don't know what possessed me to do it on this one, but I did. Um, if you don't have that done, then when you get to the edge, it just pushes the fabric with as much excess as it needs. But if it's sewn down, you'll end up with a little bubble. So I'm coming to a point where I have my safety pin, so I need to take that out because we, again, don't want to sew over those. 
They will become a permanent feature of your quilt, unless you want to break the stitches. All right, that one didn't have a little bump, but I know the ones over here did, so I'll show you. So right here, you can see there was a little bit of fullness, and because I had stitched down the edge, it just went over. Uh, it's not a big deal to me for this quilt in particular, because this will become oven mitt, so I'll be cutting it out. Um, but if this was, you know, a final quilt, like a large quilt that I was doing, I definitely wouldn't want that. So um, I don't recommend stitching down the edges first. When you're doing your quilting, whether you're doing straight line or free motion or ruler work or anything like that, once you have it all basted, it's best to start from the center and work your way out. Because what that will do is as you're quilting, any extra fullness in the top or even in the backing will get pushed to the edge. And then everything will kind of like smooth out as you go. If you start from one edge and work to the other, it might start to distort your blocks. And if you start from the outside in, you might end up with just a bunch of extra fabric from the fullness. And that just won't look very good in the center of your quilt. So... Whenever possible, start from the center and work your way out. Another added benefit for that is on larger quilts. When you're in the center, you're going to have the maximum amount of bulk that you will ever have in your sewing machine throat. Because as I go over each line, that'll become less and less. And then to do the other side, we'll flip it around, start in the center. And the same thing, it'll be the same amount of bulk. And as we move to the side, it'll become less and less. The very first quilt that I decided to machine quilt on my domestic machine, which wasn't this machine, it was um, a vintage machine that had a much smaller throat space, was a king size quilt. And let me tell you, having that much bulk in your throat, you know, your quilt all rolled up, trying to wrangle it is, is quite a workout. So if you ever need an upper, upper back shoulder workout, try quilting a king size quilt. <laughs> <laughs> on your I was gonna say, Chris, you are ambitious. <laughs> I was. It, it turned out okay. I think I wanted to start by doing straight lines, but by the end, I just gave up, and it was wavy lines. It was wavy. Out the edge of the quilt. It was one of those sure like I'm just gonna good. finish it. I don't care what it looks like. It just needs to be done. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that is it for straight line quilting. So we went over our stitch in the ditch foot and our walking foot, and then some other things you can do with your walking foot. So now I am going to switch over to the ruler foot. So this is a ruler foot. It has a high profile here, as you can see, and that is so you can follow along with your, um, your quilting template and not have your template go over because then your needle's going to hit it. It's, it's not a good thing when that happens, trust me. Uh, so it gives you a nice profile to follow along your quilting template. It also has not just a notch, but it's got a large opening here, and that's to make it adjustable depending on how thick your quilt is. So let's take this one off, and I will show you what I mean. So it goes in the same hole on the side here. I'll just loosely tighten that down. It's still movable, but you can see it'll move up and down still. We'll lower that so you can see, depending on how thick the piece is that you're quilting, you can adjust this. And what you want to do is take out the actual piece that you will be quilting. Mine is fairly thin. And you want to find you know, your average bulky spots. So sometimes it'll be where four pieces come together. If you have more pieces than that, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you'll want to just find out where it's the bulkiest and rest the foot right there. You don't want to like really push it down. You want to just kind of rest it and maybe add a little bit of pressure and then tighten that down. So it still can move freely because you're going to be moving the fabric yourself for this. Let's tighten that down so it doesn't move. 
if you had a, a loftier batting, then this would be up higher. <clears throat> For using the ruler foot, we want to lower our feed dogs. So I've done that off to the side over here. <clears throat> and that just means that as I'm sewing, you'll see these are still moving, but they're not coming above the surface to grab the fabric. So they're still going to do their thing, but it's not going to affect your piece at all. And then because we've lowered the feed dogs, your stitch length doesn't matter because your machine is not going to be controlling anything underneath your fabric. So for this quilt, I've chosen this little four inch arc. You can see I already did some tests right here of how I'm going to quilt it. But there are, let's see where I put the rulers. I think they're on the other side of the room. There are tons of different um, templates that you can get. This was from Westerly Designs. And there's a whole bunch of different shapes and different radiuses of arcs. Let me grab them. <clears throat> I'm just going to do a little plug here, too, for these templates. We're actually having so steady. They're in the future. Come on and do a whole segment on Westerly rulers and templates. So that'll be a pretty cool segment as well, because they do have so many different options. I love what you're showing. <laughs> so this is the arc that I'll be using today. And what's cool is it has an inside and an outside. Um, that comes really in handy when you're doing ruler work on your long arm because sometimes you'll get to a spot where you can't say I was like trying to go along here and I couldn't get this in place because the bar of my my long arm was right there having that inside curve lets you go still from the front side and do that arc they also have templates like this where you pop this out and that allows you to get it around your foot so that you can just do circles and then you can move it and do another circle and you just follow along. I haven't gotten to play with these yet, but I am looking forward to it because they look like tons of fun. And then just lots of other uh, templates with arcs and straight lines that can come in handy if you're trying to you know, do some stitch in the ditch or straight line ruler work. So having a good variety of these can come in really handy. You can use one for your entire quilt. You can use multiple. Just have fun with it. Now for the free motion quilting we're going to do here with the ruler and with the free motion foot, it is recommended that you not use your machine's automatic thread cutter because it cuts the bobbin thread so short that you won't be able to pull it to the front. And I'm pretty sure that I used it when I was done with that last line. Yeah, let me get a little more bobbin tail here. And the reason you want more of a bobbin tail is so that you can pull it up to the surface so that it doesn't get caught when you're moving around, doing all kinds of you know, circles and curves and going back on yourself. Okay. So I'm going to start right here. So if you just take a single stitch, oops, got my threads all messed up. There we go. If you take a single stitch and grab your top thread, it will pull your bobbin thread all the way through. And then you can grab that. So now I have both on the surface and I can hold them off to the side so they don't get stitched over and then become part of the quilting. I'm gonna take a couple anchoring stitches here just to hold those in place. And once you've anchored it, you can trim those threads shorter. So if your machine has the option to turn off your automatic thread cutter, I would do that so you don't accidentally engage it. Mine is on the foot pedal, so I just have to remember not to rock back towards myself. I'm gonna take this pin out so I don't hit it. Chris, would you mind elaborating on the foot control function where you um, just said the thread trimmer is connected to your foot control. Sure. My foot's probably a little dirty, but let me pull it up here. <laughs> uh, Brian, if you want to switch over to my other camera, might be able to see it better there. 
All right. So this is the foot pedal. Let me unplug it so I don't accidentally run away with my machine. So when you're sewing normally, you're pressing your foot forward like this. That's to stitch. That's your normal stitching. On this machine, if you rock backwards on your heel, you can see there's a little bit of movement there. That actually engages the thread cutter. So then it you probably heard it. It well, I don't want to do it, but it's a little like click sound that my machine makes. And that's it cutting both the top thread and the bobbin thread. And then you don't have to pull it away and use the thread cutter here or your snips or anything like that. So it's super handy, especially when you're piecing. But when you're quilting, not so much. Um, <laughs> Where you accidentally cut the thread. <laughs> oh, yes. And I've done it many times. Um, uh, yep. <laughs> they actually make a piece. I haven't gotten it yet. Um, but it's a little plastic that slides onto this side of the foot that prevents it from going down. So I was I just to about to mention that we do have it. I believe it's called the foot control stopper, if I'm not mistaken. Brian, would you mind throwing that in the comments for me? Yes, I'll throw it in the comments and Chris will make sure to get with you so we can get you on. Yeah, try. we'll get you on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Some machines, it's a matter of, um, you know, somewhere in your computerized settings, turning it off. This is a non-computerized machine. I prefer mechanical machines. Um, so there's no like there's no button or settings or anything. So all right, perfect. So this foot is a quarter inch from the edge of the foot to the needle. So you need to remember that when you're placing down your template. Right here, I want to end on that intersection. So I need to be a quarter of an inch away from that intersection so that as I'm following, that's where the needle will end up. If I had my template right on that corner, my stitching would end up a quarter inch away. Now doing both free motion and ruler work definitely takes practice. So I would recommend starting on something small. Um, these are gonna get cut up and turned into oven mitts. So this is a great project. If it's a little funky in some spots, it's not going to affect the usefulness of my oven mitts. So something like this is a great project to start on. I just made this patchwork about the size of a fat quarter and it's backed with a fat quarter. So it's like 18 by 20 ish. That's a great size to start with. And then you want to just have your sewing speed be steady, go a little faster than that. And then you just slowly move your fabric. Your machine is not controlling your stitch length here, you are. So a combination of the speed of your needle and the speed that you're moving the fabric will affect the length of your stitches. So just take some time and practice. And something like this, where it's just small little bursts of stitching is very good practice as well. I don't have like a really long line that I need to keep steady and have my stitches be even. It's just, you know, a little two inches from there to there. So it's really good practice. And you just keep going down. And there are a couple ways to do this particular design. I'm just doing like little scallops along the edges. And what I'll do is when I'm done going up and down, I'll turn my whole piece and then take care of these ones. But you could, as you're going down, also jump across and back, go down, across and back, down, across and back. And then that'll take care of it all in one swoop as well. That just confuses my brain sometimes. So I like to do it this way when I'm able to just rotate my entire piece to go the other direction. If your machine has the option to change, like I know a lot of machines have a button to change whether your machine stops in the down position or the up position, you'll definitely want it to be in the down position. That way, when you're done with that line, 
you're not going to accidentally move it off and then have to reposition it to start back in the same spot that you stopped. So this machine, that's its default, is always stopping in the down position, which is very handy. It's almost like they designed it for quilters. Got another pin there I'm going to take out. All right, so I've gone all the way down this side. And now I want to go up the other side. So I can switch my template to the other side and go that way. Working back up can be a little more challenging because you can't really see where you're going. Like right there, I did not hit the corner, but that's okay. So you can do it that way, or you can use that inner arc on this particular template so that I'm remaining with my left hand holding the template. You'll just want to make sure that your template is still a quarter inch away from that intersection. There you go. Now these templates did come with this um, adhesive grippy stuff. It looks kind of like shelf liner. So you can add this to the back. And if you're doing ruler work on your domestic machine, these can be really, really useful because it's going to help you get a grip on that fabric. So now it's not gonna slide. Another thing you can add is the Grace True Grips, which I'm 99% sure that you can get from sewing parts online. Um, and add a couple of those. They're clear silicone circles, and they add a lot of grip as well. But you can see through them a little better. Yeah, we can definitely help with those. The other thing, um, Chris, have you ever used the Odif spray? Miriam had shown that in the first segment. I've I have not. I've heard of it, but I've never used it. Yeah, we love the True Grips as well as the little silicone. Now, I believe uh, So Steady sends that little grippy stuff with each template, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this, this is like a starter set that you sent me, and it came with three strips of this. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it comes with it, so you could definitely use that if you like, or you can use either that spray or the True Grips. And over time, these will need to be replaced anyway. Um, so they're not permanent. You can peel them off if you need to and then try out different things and whatever works best for you. I always say go with that. So as I was doing my tests the other day, I kept breaking my thread. So earlier in this segment, when I talked about changing your needle size, I found out that it's actually because I was still trying to quilt with my number 12 needle and switching to the 16. My thread has not broken since, knock on wood. <laughs> so if you're getting frustrated and your thread keeps breaking, first thing you should do is check your needle. Either your needle might have a slight bend in it or there's a burr or something's going on there, or you just have the wrong needle size. If you're going to be quilting with a heavier weight thread, you might want to go up even another needle size to um, every needle size as you go up, the eye of the needle gets slightly larger. So if you have thick thread, you want to make sure it has plenty of room to easily glide through the eye of that needle. As you're using your templates, if you find that maybe you didn't have it positioned right, so you're coming up to that corner and you're not on track to hit it, it's okay to make slight adjustments as you're making your arc. No one should be looking at your quilt close enough to be able to tell that you're like a millimeter off on your stitching. All right, we got to the end, so I'm going to... Oh, I talked about my thread not breaking, and I just broke my thread. Figures. 
Well, we got to the end of that line. Let's look at this real quick. So that is the template there. Now we're going to switch over to our free motion foot. Uh, if you're shopping for a free motion foot, it's sometimes called a darning foot. That was its original intention, um, or a hopping foot. This one came with the Juki, and it installs similar to the walking foot. So this one has this bar right here that just sits on top of the needle bar and is spring-loaded. So it doesn't have the claw uh, like the walking foot because the needle bar makes that go up and down. This one, we just need the uh, needle bar to press it up because the spring will push it back down. So this one is pretty easy to install. Now for this foot, you're not going to want to use your templates. You can see this foot is really thin and it would be super easy for me to either get my, my template underneath it or slip on top of it. Either way, my needle's gonna hit it and that would not be a good thing. You're gonna break your needle, you'll probably break your template, things will go flying, you can mess up your uh, timing of your machine. So something to definitely be cautious of. And your eyeballs. <laughs> and your eyeballs, yes. If you don't wear glasses, your eyeballs are very at risk. So with the free motion foot, we can do this same design, just not with my foot down. No, it's not. Uh, not with the same like accuracy, but we can still get the same effect. So you can see that foot is hopping up and down there. So we've got it anchored in place, get those trimmed away. And then as you get more comfortable with your quilting, you um, just lots and lots of practice, you can even just kind of free motion those arcs. You know, you're gonna go out and then go out quite as far there. But you can do that even without a template. It just takes a little more practice. Another design you can, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I was just gonna interject with a couple of questions here. Oh, sure. um, Susan is asking, um, so you can't use those templates with the free motion foot? No. They do have some free motion feet that are have a higher profile that you might be able to use them with. But I would be very cautious because this foot bounces up and down. And when it's in its up position, you could easily get, well, probably not now, but like you could slip that underneath it. And that would not be a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, and we can definitely help with ruler feet for your machine. So if you're not sure which one fits and you're really wanting to do ruler work, just give us a call and we can help you find something that's compatible. And then I've got another question here from Camille. She said, I'm confused why you stitched backwards versus pivoting. And good to know there's a uh, special batting for oven mitts and pot holders. So she's just wondering if, yeah, why you, you stitched backwards. Sure, you totally could turn your whole project around. This is a small enough project that could have done that. But if you were dealing with like a king size quilt, that would be really cumbersome to move the entire thing through the throat. You could also, as you get to the bottom, end your stitching so you can just cut your stitches and then come back to the top and start again on the other side and work your way down. It's really just a personal preference. Some people prefer to quilt from side to side, like I could, you know, go side to side when quilting, or you can go front to back, you can go on the diagonal. It's really just finding what works best for you. And a lot of that has to do just with your upper body strength and movement, um, because, you know, people don't realize like quilting can be quite a workout. You're doing a lot of moving. You need to make sure you're in a comfortable sitting position and you're going to be, depending on the size of your quilt, moving quite a lot of bulk around and you are the one controlling it. So your hands are on here. You're moving your quilt. If there's a lot of weight off to the side here, 
you're dealing with that in your movement. So it really is just a personal preference. Any other questions? I think we're good for the moment. Okay. Um, so another thing you can do when you have your free motion hopping foot is how I really started quilting and that's stippling. So really you just find yourself a nice rhythm, a good speed, and you basically start doodling. So you can make little curves. There's no rhyme or reason to where they go. and you just kind of get in a zone. Brian's over here admiring your work. He loves a meandering stipple. <laughs> I, I do too. Um, the first several quilts I quilted, even when I got my long arm, were just a stipple. Because it gets the job done. It's kind of mindless. Um, mm -hmm. You can just, you know, go around and uh, um, the tips I've heard from like professional long arm quilters is just to try and imagine like a quarter or a dime, whatever size circle you want for your density and just try to think like, okay, keep that in mind. So as I'm going around, I want them, all my lines to be about this far apart. So this would be more along the dime um, scale. So like as you do That's your little curve, job. have it be like about a dime size apart, like anywhere in here, it's about a dime. You don't want it to be like some places really close together and others really far apart. Because when you're looking at it as an overall design, you're going to notice those spots. But if you keep it nice and consistent, you just get a really cool texture. And once you've washed this, well, probably not this one, because I don't think the insole bright will shrink like normal uh, cotton batting but you get a crinkle and just the texture that the overall stippling gives is just wonderful. I love it. Chris, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I just saw somebody in the comments that I have to say hi to. Trisha, do you know who's watching right now? I see it. And I was also Kate just about to Brennan. ask. I know. I was just ask, or gonna ask Chris, what thread are you using today? <laughs> so I am using, let me pull it down here. This is an Aurofil variegated thread. And this is the 40 weight. <laughs> yeah, this is the 40 weight. That's awesome. Brian, go ahead and say hi. <laughs> I have to come on screen to say hi really quickly. <laughs> hi, Kate. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the show. I hope we get to hang out one day. <laughs> so Chris is probably like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> You've met Kate Brennan. She's with um, Orophil, and she's been on the show with us before. And we just love Kate, and we love Orophil, and you're using Orophil. So we're like, we're going to say hi to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right well that is my demo for the day i hope everyone got some good tips and tricks out of that let me switch back to my normal camera there we go get this wire out of my face absolutely yeah we had some wonderful tips now um, I do want to just ask you a couple questions. So sure. this machine in front of me is going to be the TL2000QI. So it's considered like a step down from the TL2010Q. What do you um, consider your favorite aspect of the TL? Well, I love the whole thing overall. Like it has been <laughs> an amazing machine. I love its speed for my piecing um, and mm -hmm. its accuracy. It makes beautiful stitches and it's just, it's simple. There's not, there's no computerized parts. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. there is like the thread cutter, but like there's no computer screen. There's not a thousand different stitches. So it's not so overwhelming. Like you have, you got your stitch length. There's your cutter, needle up and down and reverse. And that's really it. Like it's just super yeah. simple and straightforward. And that I really appreciate about it. Um, the speed control I have found I'm using more than I thought I would. This is the first machine mm -hmm. I've ever had that had a speed control. And I find that to be really helpful because I'm usually just like floor it. And sometimes that's not the best thing. 
Yeah. I think that's pretty funny too, because we had a previous guest. It was um, Luann and she was with Juki. And actually I have this little filters ring. She paired it with her TL2010Q and she had given the tip of using the speed control to really regulate because you're moving your fabric. Have you used one of these before? I have not. I've seen them, but I've never used one. It's pretty cool. So when you were doing that free motion sewing, you can hold on to these knobs and it helps you move your fabric around. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, she was doing that and then set her speed control and she was just getting beautiful results. And I'm like, I need to really try that, that application. But I too am using my speed control more often. So it's a, a great one. And I don't know if I can have a machine without a thread cutter anymore. I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, that wasn't on my must have list when I was shopping for a new machine, but it probably would be now. Yeah. Like, you don't really realize handy. you need it until <laughs> you don't have it. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, I for also those really like that it comes with the extended bed. Oh yeah. Like that, that has really been a game changer for this. Mm -hmm. Having that. Awesome. Well, for those that are just joining us, Chris, do you want to let everybody know where they can find you? Sure. So I'm online. I'm on pretty much all the platforms. So TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and everything is under at Rose City Originals. And you can see all of my original quilt patterns. I post pretty much every day, either what project I'm working on, tips and tricks. Um, I try to answer questions as people ask them in my videos, just so I can be kind of a, a go-to um, resource for it. I really love quilting. So I like Sharon. You're a great resource. Well, and actually Sharon here is asking, is this considered a quilting machine? Yes. So I can answer that if you want. Sure. So technically it is considered a quilting machine, but I do have to say that it has so many different applications. The reason that I ended up buying this machine was because, or the one up above on this one is because of bag making. So you can be a quilter. You could be bag making. You can do it with garment sewing. I've used it in that application as well. Home I... decor. So yeah, his wonderful shirts. <laughs> yeah, yep. so many great applications. So technically saying quilting machine, but it's a beautiful straight stitch machine for many, many awesome options. So yes. well, do you want to stick around while we do a giveaway for that arrow organizing cube? Sure. Awesome. Yes. All right. Brian, do you want to go ahead and pull up the giveaway tool? Oh, you're already ahead of me. <laughs> I did, I did a, a riddle in the comments this time, oh. and I want to know if people liked it. If people liked it, I'll do it again. <laughs> Donna, congratulations. Donna, congratulations. That's awesome. I'll show you how to claim your prize here in just a moment, but we're just going to say goodbye to Chris, and we will see you next time. We're super excited. I think you're going to do some foundation paper piecing in July, right? That's the plan. <laughs> That's the plan. All right. Well, we'll see you in July. <laughs> All right. Thank you. See you, everyone. Yeah.